All right, let's get right into it. We're talking about aortic surgery, and honestly, this is one of the most high-stakes arenas in all of medicine. You have to understand this isn't just any old operation. We're talking about going in and working on the body's largest, highest-pressure artery. It is quite literally navigating on a knife's edge. And that really brings us to the big question, the one that hangs over this entire topic. How is it even possible to survive surgery on this, this main pipeline? I mean, think about it. How do you stop the blood flow to basically your entire body, fix a problem that's about to kill you, and then get everything running again without a total catastrophe? So, the two big villains of this story are aortic aneurysms and dissections. An aneurysm, well, that's when the wall of the aorta gets weak and starts to balloon out, kind of like a weak spot on a tire that's about to blow. A dissection is different. That's a tear in the inner lining of the aorta. Blood starts tunneling into the wall itself. Both of these are ticking time bombs. If they rupture, it's almost always game over. And if you want to know just how high the stakes are, look at this number, over 90%. That's the mortality rate for someone with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm who doesn't make it to a hospital in time. It just shows you the incredible lethality we are up against, and it's exactly why these surgeries are so, so critical. This brings us to the absolute core challenge of traditional open aortic surgery. It all comes down to a single moment, a moment that completely upends the body's entire system. We call it the cross-clamp crisis. So to even begin to repair the aorta, surgeons have to do something pretty drastic. They have to clamp it shut to stop the blood flow. Just try to picture that. It's like pinching off the main water line for an entire city. That one, single action, applying the aortic cross clamp, unleashes an absolute physiological storm inside the patient. And this slide, this lays out the incredible balancing act that follows. The second that clamp goes on, bam, blood pressure above it goes through the roof, putting insane strain on the heart. The anesthesia team has to jump in immediately, pushing drugs to fight that surge. But then, the moment the repair is done and the clamp comes off, the exact opposite crisis hits. Blood pressure absolutely plummets as blood rushes back into those starved tissues, bringing a flood of metabolic toxins with it. And again, the team has to instantly reverse course, pumping in fluids and pressure-raising drugs to stop the patient from crashing. It is a violent, minute-by-minute -minute war between two extremes. Okay, so just managing those insane pressure swings is a huge part of the job. But at the exact same time, the anesthesia team is fighting another battle, trying to prevent catastrophic, permanent damage to the body's most critical organs. Let's talk about the spinal cord. In big thoracoabdominal repairs, the risk of paralysis, becoming paraplegic, is terrifyingly real. So to prevent this, anesthesiologists have a whole playbook. They can actually drain some cerebrospinal fluid to lower the pressure around the spinal cord, which helps improve its blood supply. They can cool the patient's entire body down, which makes the cord need less oxygen. They can even set up special bypass circuits to pump blood to the body below the clamp. And the whole time, they are using real-time neuromonitoring to watch for any sign of trouble, literally second by second. Now, when we get to the kidneys, it's a bit of a different story. You might think the biggest risk factor for kidney failure is something that happens during the surgery itself, but it's not. The single greatest predictor is how well the patient's kidneys were working before they even got to the operating room. That pre-existing condition basically sets the stage for everything else. So, to protect the kidneys, the name of the game is stability. Just keeping the blood pressure and the blood volume steady is the most important thing you can do. They can also use drugs like mannitol to help things along. And, this is super important for the newer techniques we're about to see, they have to be really careful with contrast dye, which can be tough on the kidneys. You see, for years and years, that whole cross-clamp crisis was the only way to do it. But things have changed, a lot. And that's thanks to a newer, much less invasive approach that has truly sparked a revolution. The endovascular revolution. And this whole revolution is built around this one incredible piece of technology, the stent graft. So picture this, it's basically a fabric tube that's held open by a metal mesh, like a scaffold. They collapse this whole thing down, feed it up through a small catheter, usually from an artery in your groin, and then deploy it right inside the aorta. It creates a new, reinforced tunnel for blood to flow through, sealing off the weak, ballooning part of the artery from the inside out. And the difference between the two approaches, I mean, it's just night and day. 
Look at this. Open repair means a huge incision, the chaos of the cross clamp, and lots of blood loss. The endovascular approach, known as EVAR or TVAR, while that's done through tiny punctures, it usually avoids the cross clamp completely, there's minimal blood loss, and you might not even need general anesthesia. It's a completely different philosophy. But, and there's always a but, right? This amazing new technique brings its own unique, incredibly difficult challenge. That stent graft, it has to be deployed with absolute pinpoint precision. We are talking about millimeter accuracy. If you're off by just a tiny bit, you could accidentally cover up a critical artery branching off to your kidneys or your gut, and that would be a disaster. So how on earth do you place something that precisely inside the body's biggest, fastest flowing artery? Well, with a brilliant and kind of mind-blowing technique called rapid ventricular pacing. For just a few seconds, the anesthesia team uses a pacemaker to drive the heart at an insanely fast rate, like 180 to 220 beats per minute. This effectively makes the heart unable to pump blood forward, so the blood pressure drops to nearly zero for a moment. It creates this brief window of calm, letting the surgeon deploy the graft perfectly without it getting blasted downstream by blood flow. It's incredible. And the tech just keeps getting better. Now we have things like fenestrated EVAR or FIVAR. These are custom-made grafts with little holes or fenestrations cut out of them that line up perfectly with the arteries branching off the aorta. And it gets even crazier. There's multi-branched EVAR, or MVVAR, which has little branches already built into the graft to reconnect flow. These advancements let surgeons fix really complex aneurysms that used to be impossible to treat this way. So we've seen these two very different worlds, right? The, the brutal elegance of open surgery and the high-tech precision of the endovascular approach. But for all their differences, here's the key takeaway. The core mission for the anesthesiologist never, ever changes. There's this one quote from the medical literature that just sums it all up perfectly. It says that keeping the organs supplied with blood by providing stable hemodynamics is more important to the final outcome than any specific drug or technique you choose. So what does that really mean? It means that whether you're wrestling with the physiological storm of a cross clamp or you're intentionally stopping the heart for a few seconds for a precision deployment, your fundamental job is exactly the same. Keep the patient's entire system in perfect, stable balance through a period of unbelievable stress. Which kind of leaves us with this final thought. In a surgery that is defined by stopping, starting, and rerouting the very flow of life, what does it really take to be that guardian of flow? To stand there and keep every single organ perfectly balanced in that razor-thin space between too much pressure and not nearly enough? Well, the answer is a masterful mix of science, constant vigilance, and a whole lot of nerve.